Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thanks for tuning in to our virtual event. My name is Alejandra Hernandez, and I am the Conservation Policy Associate with the Michael Fields Agricultural Institute. Michael Fields is based in East Troy, Wisconsin, uh, and we work to advance sustainable agriculture through research, policy, and education. Uh, we are so excited to have an event centered on the topic of dung beetles and the role that they play in soil and water quality in a farm ecosystem. So for now, I'm going to invite you to type in your name in the chat box um, so that we can all see where you're tuning in from as we begin. And again, welcome. The chat, if you go to the bottom of the screen, uh, there is a chat thing there and you can type in to everyone. Uh, your name and I've also put a poll up as well that folks can just uh, choose one of the options whether you're from the Munt Creek Knights Hollow watershed in Iowa County, elsewhere in southwest Wisconsin or somewhere else and so when you do that it'll disappear off the screen and uh, go ahead and go Andra. Yeah thank you. Um, so this morning we checked registration and we just wanted to show you uh, the map that the couple of maps that we that we made um, showing the different registrants from all over the world. So dung beetles is a very interesting topic and we're so excited to talk more about that. Um, all our work is done in collaboration with various partners. Uh, so I want to take this time to thank all our partners. Um, so we worked with the Uplands Watershed group, the Iowa County Land Conservation Department and UW Extension. And I want to give a special shout out to Kevin Erb, who is really helping us with a lot of the technology and has been a great collaborator. And in front of you, you see all these logos of different partners who helped us um, do a lot of our outreach work. So thank you again. So a couple of housekeeping rules. Please make sure that you keep your audio muted. Uh, you can use the chat box um, on your screen if you have any questions, comments, or technical issues. Uh, towards the end, we have reserved time for questions and answers. And so please, during that time, if you have questions for our panelists, you can either type them out in the chat box or unmute yourself and ask the question yourself. Okay, great. So in front of you, you we wanna set the context. So we are going to be visiting a farm in Wisconsin, and it's in the southwestern part of Wisconsin, which you can see in front of your map. And the Uplands Farmer-Led Watershed Group is found to the left of Madison. So on the lower right-hand corner, you see Madison. So the area that we're looking into is towards the west of Madison. You see a dotted line that says Mill Creek River. And so that's the region that, that we're focusing on today. So our Iowa County Uplands Led Watershed Group um, has an, a very interesting landscape. As you see with this map, it's super hilly um, and, and we have the Wisconsin River right there to the north of the watershed. And so this means that, you know, a, a lot of our farms are dealing with, you know, soil erosion problems and, um, you know, are, have to keep in mind where the water goes since it feeds into the Wisconsin River, which ultimately lands into the Mississippi River. So for today, the agenda, we're going to start with a virtual tour visiting Wonder Acres Farm and Sherry Knowlton um, is one of the Uplands Watershed Farmers that will be talking about dung beetles and the way that she manages for dung beetles at her farm, followed by a how-to video on how to um, perform water infiltration tests on your farm. And then we'll have Kevin Erb from UW-Madison Extension talk to us about um, future types of events um, that we could have, and then followed by our panelists and question and answers. So I want to give a quick introduction to our panelists. So first we have Katie Abbott, um, and Katie Abbott is a county conservationist for the Iowa County Land Conservation Department. She worked in Southwest Wisconsin for 14 years, helping farmers and landowners with conservation problems that result in healthier soil, water, wildlife, and communities. We have Landon Baumgartner, the conservation specialist for the Iowa County Land Conservation Department. He has also worked with the Natural Resources Conservation Service, implementing agronomic conservation programming after obtaining a bachelor's degree in environmental science. We also have Dr. Nadine Kriska. 
biology professor at University of Wisconsin Whitewater. She is a beetle taxonomist with a background in Wisconsin scarab beetles and particularly the natural history and basic ecology of the state's many dung beetle species. We have Sherry Nolden, a PhD candidate in animal and dairy sciences at UW-Madison. She's a farmer in the Uplands Watershed Group in Dodgeville, Wisconsin, where she integrates grass-based livestock production with wildlife and natural resource management. And finally, we have Gene Schreifer. He is the Ag Educator for UW-Madison Division of Extension in Iowa County. His focus is on livestock production forages and moving towards a strong grazing emphasis in the region to improve soil stewardship and farm profit, protect ground and surface water, and add resiliency to farm systems facing climate change. So thank you so much to our panelists for joining us today. And now we are going to begin our tour of Wonder Acres Farm. Um, you can adjust the audio on your end and if you have trouble with connectivity during the video portion, we will make sure to post uh, the videos to YouTube um, after, after this virtual event. Thank you. One other thing I will ask, and that is that everybody that has their camera on to temporarily turn it off because that for folks that are not in an area with really good internet, uh, that will impact your ability to view. So I'm gonna turn mine off and we'll ask everybody else to as well. Today we are taking a journey to Wonder Acres Farm, located in Dodgeville, Wisconsin. The farm is managed by Sherry Nolden and Alan Philo. They manage a total of 130 acres, comprised of 50 acres of the home farm and 80 acres of additional forest. They rotationally graze goats, horses, beef, sheep, pigs, and poultry, and protect them with livestock guardian dogs so they can remain on pasture 24-7. They help improve and protect the soil and water on their farm through various practices such as continuous perennial cover, holistic planned grazing with multiple species, properly timed conventional fertility applications, managing for different varieties of dung beetles, and surrounding bare soil areas by buffers of tall vegetation to intercept water and nutrients. Their animals live in various mixes of species and groups throughout the year to achieve their land management goals. Now we will have Sherry Nolden, an Uplands Watershed farmer and a doctoral candidate, speak to the diversity of dung beetles on the farm and the different practices of dung beetle management. This farm was a cornfield, a crop field before we bought it, so um, it was, it was uh, actually in CRP and then um, into corn, and then we planted perennial pasture. And, just in managing our livestock um, with holistic plan grazing and um, minimal deworming to no deworming or only deworming during um, the fall into winter and not uh, destroying the, the food source of the larvae of the dung beetle, um, we have the ability to attract and uh, maintain the populations of dung beetles that are here. And so the, the two main types of the three types of dung beetle species that are out there that we have here at this farm are uh, tunnelers and dweller species. We don't have the roller species. When people are collecting samples of dung beetles from a manure pad, they would grab the manure pad, stick it in a bucket of water, and all the dung beetles float up. So then you just sit and wait and watch the surface and look for beetles that are coming up to the surface with management that that promotes dung beetles, they can be beneficial for helping us cycle our nutrients, improve soil structure. They double their their activity can double the yield of forages in a system that has active dung beetles. Um, water infiltration rate doubles with dung beetle um, additions to the system. So they're very beneficial um, if we manage for them, and and management includes avoiding. Um, the macrocyclic lactones that cause the larvae to die um, when we're deworming uh, livestock and managing deworming so that they're dewormed in the winter instead of the summer here in freezing Wisconsin. Um, and for the dweller species, these species that, um, that live their entire life cycle in the manure pad, 
not disturbing that manure pad for the entire four to six weeks that it takes for them to, em to emerge into an adult is important. And um, that can be done if you have a shorter rotation than that by having the same species come through because they're going to avoid their own manure places. Um, or if you have longer rotations, that can be um, managed that way. And some species will uh, live for a couple years, other species only a few months. Um, their activity is seasonal for different species, so throughout the summer we see different species rise and fall, and I, I think what I've seen, the, the um, hydrophilid beetles definitely are more active when face fly season is crazy going strong, so because that's their food source. So they, they explode when the face fly population explodes, which causes the face fly population to decline, which is great for our livestock. Those are the three main beetle species that we have on this farm, um, the most abundant and uh, active among all the different species. And so this is a dweller species, this is a dweller species, and this is a tunneling species. Um, and they all do different things. This one and its um, larvae eat manure. This one eats eggs and larvae of pest fly species. And this one buries manure um, and helps with nutrient, even more nutrient cycling than the other species on the farm here. Um, this is the scavenger species of dung beetle that um, that we often find running very quickly through the manure paths, and this is the one that eats the, the larvae of this insect, eat larvae and fly eggs from face flies and horn flies, and so they're a very beneficial species. This is a what's considered a hydrophilid beetle, meaning that they live in the manure pat, and they complete their entire life cycle in the manure pat. Um, they don't leave it, so if the manure pat gets disturbed while their life cycle is happening, they're not going to reproduce very well. They can have kind of red spots on their side and a little bit of a gold color on their rear end and kind of a black, shiny, really smooth body. Um, they're very numerous here. This species is Anthophagus hectate is one of our tunneling species. This species is good for soil health because it takes the manure, digs a hole under the manure pat, and buries manure in the soil while doing bioturbation, bringing soil up from the surface and improving soil aeration. It's burying organic matter, it's burying nitrogen and all of the components of the manure. It lays its egg in um, each little dung ball that it uh, places underground and there's some actual parental care that is provided by some of these beetles too um, for their offspring. The male has a little bit of a horn on the, the front of his thorax whereas the female doesn't. Any farm that manages for them should be able to get them to arrive and benefit from their activity um, on the farm. continue at Sherry Nolden's farm and what we'll do is now we're going to have Jean and Landon um, who are going to teach us about different types of tests that we can do to determine soil health at your farm. So let me screen share again. <laughs> I'm Gene Schriefer, uh, Ag Educator with University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. I'm out in Iowa County and I work with the uh, local watershed group. And today we are demonstrating some of the tools that are included in the Soil Health Test Kit. And this is an old piece of irrigation pipe. It's about six inches in diameter. Uh, we're going to insert this uh, in the soil approximately half the distance, so about three inches or so. Uh, because it's made out of aluminum, 
we also give you a high quality block of wood. Uh, and with this, we're going to put that on top and then uh, also have a rubber mallet, which will allow you to pound that into the soil to the appropriate depth without bunging up this edge and peening that over. So I've put that in as evenly as I possibly can. And I've pulled out some of the excess debris inside the infiltration ring. So we've got our ring here. Um, and then we have to add uh, the equivalent of about one inch of water. Now, we, we've recently had rain. Uh, if we haven't had rain in the last few days, we would normally wet this first and allow that to sink in. Once there's no more water present, then we're going to measure and time that second application of water. So for six inches, one inch in a six inch circle translates into about 444 milliliters. And I can't see, I've got it marked. I can see that on my graduated cylinder, but that's how much water is the equivalent of one inch in a six inch ring. Now we're going to and we are at 444 milliliters. Now one of the things that we also do besides removing debris is we're going to just put a small piece of plastic wrap. This is also in your kit. Uh, and this is to really, we're trying to get a true measurement of what it might be for rainfall. We don't want to disturb the soil by dumping this in very hard or very fast because that might disturb the soil and influence the rate of infiltration rate. So we're going to put this in gently, remove that, and then we're going to have uh, a stopwatch. Um, our water infiltration test begins by dumping that in. 440 milliliters in that six inch diameter. And then we're going to pull that and then hopefully quickly turn on the stopwatch. And we're gonna say stop. See that entire uh, one inch equivalent of water infiltrate. We're going to call this done. So I'm going to hit stop. And what we're looking for is where we can see that the soil surface is kind of wet and glistening. There shouldn't be any pools or puddles of water. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we're showing about 5 minutes and 21 seconds for that water infiltration rate. So we could take that information and we could actually calculate what a inch per hour rate would be. Um, in this case, I haven't done the calculations, but my guess is this is going to turn out to be about five to six inches per hour in uh, a water infiltration rate, which should take care of most of our bigger storms. It's not going to take care of our 17-inch rainfall, but this farm is going to capture and store a lot more water than one that uh, uh, might take 10, 15, 20 minutes. And I've seen some where the water hasn't infiltrated after 25 minutes with just a single inch of water. So more infiltration rate is good. This will depend on your soil type and as well as your management. So sands inherently drain faster. We're on a, a silty loam soil here today with a clay subsoil. Uh, this is really a great soil for holding water and giving up water for crops. Uh, and it has a moderately good uh, water infiltration rate. Uh, I'm Landon Baumgartner. I'm the conservation specialist here for the Iowa County Land Conservation Department here in Dodgeville. And uh, we are doing a soil health kit um, field test today, um, which includes a test known as the slake test. And we're going to be demonstrating that here. Um, what this test is used for is to show how the structure of a soil um, um, uh, is, uh, uh, what, the, what the quality of the structure of soil is. Um, and basically it can be done with this little net cup here from a regular sink drain and uh, a cup of water. And what it basically does is it looks uh, at how soil is going to behave when water rushes into the pore space that is in a soil sample. 
So a healthy soil will uh, more or less hold up under the pressure of a massive amount of water rushing in to fill those pore spaces as water does. Um, and uh, if it's a good and healthy soil, um, all the natural biological glue, such as glomulin, will be able to make sure those pores stay intact and not collapse so much. Um, here we are in a perennial grass pasture setting. Um, so it may look a little bit different based on the type of land that you are going to be doing the test in. Um, but essentially what we have here is a um, silky loam soil that has been placed in this cup. And as you can see, there's a little bit of dissipation of particles falling out of uh, this head that we have. But more or less, the structure is staying relatively intact. If we were in an area that was that was uh, more conventionally operated, uh, undergoing a lot of tillage or a lot of mechanical disturbance, uh, we'd probably see that water sample get a little bit more cloudy, um, as well as um, if it were a differently managed system, we may have it be even clearer yet. Um, but this is just a way that you can evaluate um, what your soil structure is like and how um, it will uh, behave under pressure from water. So that concludes our trip to Wonder Acres Farm. Thank you so much, Sherry, Jean, and Landon. And so now I will um, let Kevin Erb take it away so he can share a few words with us. And let me stop screen sharing here so that I can as well. So I do want to thank everybody for being a part of today. What we've talked about here for the past couple of minutes is really Sherry's experience with dung beetles, what she's found on her farm with some of the native species that have been there, and um, then really talking about soil health and what that means and two simple tests to really get at um, soil health, uh, really evaluating soil health on your particular farm. So I want to take a couple of minutes here uh, talking about how we take today's lessons of improving soil health and managing dung beetles into our own pastures and say, you know, is this really making a difference? And we're going to get into that here in the panel discussion, talking about dung beetle management. But part of the reason that I'm involved and engaged in today's session is that we have funding through the DNR's Nike Element Watershed Program, including Munt Creek and Knights Hollow, to do soil health training and testing for those that farm and live in and around those watersheds. And one of the things that you saw both Landon and Jean using is the soil health test kit. We do provide those um, as no charge as part of the training program that uh, we do put together. And so our plan had been obviously before the pandemic to do that uh, here in 2020 we're looking at doing that in 2021. And so if you do farm in and around those watersheds and have an interest in learning more about <clears throat> soil health management and getting one of these kits, you can see a photo there on the right, but we do include a compaction probe, uh, infiltration test um, components like you saw Gene demonstrate and the tailgate slake test as well. And there'll be a number of these in nine key element watersheds around the state where if you farm or live in and around those or consult or work with an agency, you can take part and get one of those kits. In the meantime, though, we're here in the middle of winter, we're in a pandemic, we do have four online soil health training classes available free at no charge. There's an introduction to soil health, one focusing on cover crops, one on how do you improve the ability of the soil to hold water uh, in dry times and let it get out of the root zone in wet times and then holistically looking at a systems approach to soil health management systems. And so if you're interested in that, I would ask you to put your name and your email in the chat box. And you may say, well, my name's already there. Well, some folks, when they signed in, it says grandma's iPad because the first person that went into Zoom uh, put that in there. And so if you are interested in learning more um, or if you are interested in CCA CEUs for today, uh, I am going to ask you to write down my email address and email me with both your name and your CCA number, and uh, we will get that taken care of as well. So 
either email or chat is fine, but you're not here to listen to me. You're here to listen to the experts talk about dung beetles and really making them work for you in terms of increasing soil health and increasing the health of your pastures. And so with that, Alejandra, I'm gonna turn this back over to you here and um, let you bring forth our panel. Thank you so much, Kevin. So yeah, so now we're going to hear from our panelists. This is a very exciting time. And our first panelist will be Dr. Nadine Kriska. So I welcome you to open up your video um, and unmute yourself, Dr. Nadine. Hello. Hi, hi, thanks for joining us. So Dr. Nadine, in the, in the video, we learned that at Wonder Acres Farm, we find tunneler and dweller species. So what are different types of dung beetles that we find throughout Wisconsin and how are the species distributed across the country? Um, in the south versus the north part of the country. And we are wondering if there are different beetles for different type of livestock and what are those functions? Sure. Um, first of all, of all, I will just start by saying that um, Wisconsin is kind of a unique state. Um, for the most part, uh, when we're looking at uh, dung beetles and other beetles in general, we have a lot of fauna that goes along with kind of the eastern part of the United States. But uh, we also tend to be kind of a northernmost um, end of a range for a lot of the more southern types of beetle species. Um, for ones that are more northern, we tend to be their southernmost range. And we also do have some species that are more associated with the Western US that kind of just make their way into the Western portion of Wisconsin. And we also see some trends and boundaries because Wisconsin has this area that's called the tension zone. And it goes through kind of the middle of Wisconsin and it's kind of a demarcation of where we find the southernmost range for a lot of species, including a lot of plant species, and northernmost ranges for a lot of the southern plant species and other species. Um, so with the dung beetles, we certainly have um, a lot of native species, and we do have tunnelers, rollers, and dwellers. Uh, we also have several introduced species, mostly European species, and a lot of those are the dwellers and a few uh, tunnelers. So as far as the um, roller dung beetles are concerned, we don't get a lot of um, species. There's maybe about five species that occur here, and they're not in very large numbers. And depending on the species, um, we find that a lot of them are actually occurring just a little bit north of, um, like kind of down into the tension zone, just kind of hovering above it. Um, there is a species that is found in more of the western part of the state, but um, again, it's not very common. So out of all of the dung beetle species, uh, the rollers are the ones that you would be least likely to encounter. Um, there is one species, it's called the Melanocanthon. It's kind of a um, little medium-sized black beetle that is a roller. Out of all of them, that might be one that people may encounter out there on occasion. Um, for the uh, dwellers and the tunnelers, um, that again is where we find most of the beetle species that would be occurring in pastures. And um, as far as just among those different species, how they compare to kind of northern versus southern species of dung beetles in the US, um, the big issue in Wisconsin is that we certainly have this issue of climate and seasonality. So we have um, rather cold winters. 
So most of our species are not going to be active during those especially cold winter months. Whereas species that you find further south because the climate is more moderate, um, those species tend to be active um, more year round. Um, so also because of that climate um, issue, we tend to see kind of overall less turnover um, with the breakdown of the cow patties, like e even during the active spring through um, fall months compared to what you would see um, in the south, like going on year round. Um, as far as the beetles preferences, um, most of the dung beetles that you would find in the pastures are going to be more of the generalists. Um, you know, they certainly will utilize the cow dung. Um, you would find a lot of them also in the horse dung, um, even utilizing, you know, sheep and pig dung. Um, pig dung, by the way, is a really good dung to use in baited pitfall traps. If you're curious to know um, beetles that you have, you can set up a little plastic cup, put it in the ground so that the lip of the cup is kind of flush with the ground. Um, add a little bit of pig dung into a small container, kind of find a way to hover it over the cup. And over a couple of days, you can kind of monitor what's coming in and falling into the cup. Um, so our dung beetles, a lot of them are really into that pig dung from what I've seen with my trapping. Um, for a lot of the native species that we have in Wisconsin, um, you know, we do see, again, some that are in the pastures or utilizing the cow dung and these other sources. Um, we do have some native species that, you know, they are pretty specific, but they're not going to be specific to the cattles or horses so much. Um, they're more into things like deer dung, or they're really specific. You might only find them in squirrel nests or utilizing owl pellets. Um, so again, for our um, most common pasture species, um, it's a lot of the tunnelers, which are the kind of smaller sized species and they'll spend their entire lives just in the paddy. And they're right at the kind of bottom of the paddy and the interface of the paddy and the ground. Um, for the tunnelers, um, things like the Anthophagus hicati, they tend to make their tunnels like directly below the paddy and they can go downwards to about a foot, you know, anywhere between five centimeters upwards of 26 centimeters. Um, and Again, with the tunnelers in particular, they are especially important in kind of helping with that uh, overturning of the soil and mixing up the nutrients as they are bringing it down into their tunnels and provisioning their larvae with food. Um, I guess for the last part of the question, um, the different kinds of dung beetles, varying significantly across different landscapes. Um, again, most of that just has to do with the geography of Wisconsin and ranges, as well as um, kind of the seasonality that we get. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Nadine. Um, and as a reminder to our audience, we will leave uh, reserve some time for Q&A towards the end. So as you're thinking about these questions, uh, we'll let you know um, after all the panelists are done speaking to ask those questions. And I see some coming in through the chat box, so that's great. And you can also indicate um, who that panelist is if you have a specific question for a certain panelist. All right, so next um, we're gonna turn it over to Jean. Thank you, Jean, for coming. Uh, so Jean, uh, we have grazers um, on top of the soil and insects and microbes below the soil. Uh, so it's really important to manage not just for a crop, but for a whole system. 
and dung beetles can be part of that system as we saw in the video. So what are practices that can help maintain a healthy environment for dung beetles? And what is the role of dung beetles in water infiltration? Sure, sure. Um, you know, we, we, we identify as a sheep producer, goat producer, beef producer, that's our focus. The grass is, is what those, uh, you know, those livestock are eating. But we, we have a, a tremendous amount of, of livestock in the soil that we don't really think about. Um, Jerry Hatfield was a researcher, he's now retired uh, with the Ag Research Service uh, at the National Soil Tilth Lab. And he made the comment to me one day that there's about two African elephants worth of weight in living biology in every acre of soil. And that biology has to get fed every day. And that, that's what our live plants do. That's what, when we have uh, livestock depositing on manure do, they're all feeding all of that, of that biology. And so um, as I get out onto pastures, I'm trying to do a, a quick assessment uh, on what the health of that pasture is, looking at species diversity, uh, looking at other uh, uh, species diversity in the forages, but I'm also thinking about uh, diversity in insects because those are the, that, the macro fauna that we can easily see. Um, we don't have the tools at least to see into the soil for those microbes. That's a little bit more uh, complicated to do that testing. And uh, uh, so the, the seeing a, a, a manure pie already con or, 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 uh, colonized by dung beetles uh, or previously colonized by dung beetles where you kick over a cow pie and you look at the bottom, you can still find them there uh, many times, is kind of that indirect assessment of, of, uh, of biology. Uh, the more insects that we have, uh, often I see that as a good thing, because if we were to actually look at and capture those insects, uh, you'll see that 30% or more are actually predator insects. Insects consuming and eating and hunting other insects. When we see that part of the food chain intact, the next thing you're going to easily see or should easily see is, is uh, an abundance of insect eating birds, right? If there's a food source, then the birds will come. So th these are all just uh, 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 um, easy visual assessments to say, I've got a healthy ecosystem. And that's what livestock producers that are actually managing their pastures are doing. They're actually managing an ecosystem. We don't think about it that way, but that's really what's happening if, if they're going to be successful. So for the dung beetle, um, again, they're, they're kind of an indirect assessment. Uh, we know there's other beetles there. There's other of those macro fauna there. Um, when we've got a healthy soil or we're trying to get healthy soil, uh, soil is actually only about, should be only about 50% solid material. The other 50% is air, room for air, gas exchange, and water, okay? And when we've got... Um, the, the soil microbes, we've got these actinomycetes, these uh, fungal hyphae, and these dung beetles, uh, they create different uh, pores. Uh, we have uh, large pores, small pores. The, the um, easiest way to, I, I, I can think about it is uh, thinking about uh, an interstate highway system uh, that goes down to a smaller state highway system to the county road system, to the, to the township road system. Those roads get smaller. We go from a four or five, six lane to a four, to a two lane, to a one lane, uh, maybe down to the driveway. And that's what's going on with pores in our soil. We've got to have these large pores to quickly infiltrate water when we get these intense rainfall events, leading to smaller pores that distribute it out further into the soil, and then all the way down to these micro pores. And you think about that beetle look pretty small, but if we've got a lot of those beetles, especially those tunnelers, that's opened up a large pore to get air and gas exchanging with the soil. And when we do have these five, six, seven, 10 inch rainfalls, encouraging that water infiltration into the soil, distributing it through the soil, growing more grass. Thank you, thank you so much, Gene. So yeah, managing for an ecosystem, so, so important. Thank you. Um, and now we're gonna, moving into the 
the theme of continuing the theme of ecosystem, we're going to talk more um, on uh, water and infiltration. So our next panelist is Landon. Um, and Landon, if you can unmute yourself and turn on video. So Landon, um, a couple questions for you. So in the video, you were showing us a slick test. So what does what is a slick test trying to tell us? And what are conservation practices that can increase um, soil permeability? And are there soil health tests that you would recommend to farmers um, besides the ones depicted in the video? Do we have, oh, oh Landon, I believe you're muted. Yeah, well, okay, he's calling in, okay. I, I can handle the question if you want me to, if you want to keep going. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. So the, the slake test is, um, you know, really looking at measuring how well soil is glued together. And the best way to do that is to stop disturbing it, which is what tillage does. Tillage destroys soil structure. Soil does not want to be, uh, wants to have structure. And so as we disturb soil less, uh, those root exudates uh, coming from live plants are feeding uh, actinomycetes. These are the fungal hyphae that are colonizing, reaching out their hyphae through the soil, bringing nutrients and water to the roots of the plant. And one of the things that those hyphae uh, excrete is a substance called glomalin, which, as Landon explained, is um, like a soil glue. And as that glue uh, exudates from the soil hyphae, it glues small pieces of soil together. And then those small pieces get glued together into larger pieces. And as we do that, as you compact the small area, we wind up with that pore space. You know, that's the, those micro channels uh, that uh, um, uh, water and air are able to infiltrate through. So the slate test that uh, Landon was demonstrating um, really is showing how much glomalin is present in that soil, how well in the presence of water and moisture that soil holds together and or doesn't hold together. Um, when we've done this uh, at field days live, uh, we typically have two or three samples. One is always going to be from a, a tilled soil and by the time we measure our five minutes, there's going to be very little soil left in that basket. It's all at the bottom. Uh, so it, it just disintegrates. There's no structure to it. So structure is good. Uh, less disturbance is good, which is why um, pastures, which are very rarely disturbed at all for tillage, um, are, are really exceptional at water infiltration. And the idea of green growing plants feeding soil biology, including those fungal hyphae, uh, is really an essential part of, of, of uh, 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 establishing that uh, soil structure. And that glomalin is, is actually, it's a polysaccharide, it's actually a, a, a carbon source. So in, van, in the end, it gets broken down and it becomes feed for some other biology. Awesome. And oh, sorry, then, sorry, Jean, I saw that Landon called in. I'm just making sure. Are, is your audio working now, Landon? I'm just calling on my phone. But Gina okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everything and more about <laughs> Great. Landon, after Gene, do you want to talk about what uh, health tests that you would recommend for farmers? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. <laughs> the, the only thing, other one part I would make is that if we're not having pasture, this is why we were emphasizing cover crops, something green growing as many months of the year as at all possible. And when we do that, that's the basis of, uh, um, uh, you know, that, that, that whole uh, part of the food chain of, of, of gluing it together, uh, structural uh, integrity in the soil, biological uh, activity, uh, and they're all, that's where they're all interrelated. And what makes it so complex to study, uh, it's, 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 it is a system and, uh, uh, and we have to manage all parts at the same time. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Gene. Okay, so now, now before you uh, turn over to Bruce here, just letting people know we've got about eight minutes before mm -hmm. um, 
We're going to wrap things up. A few of us will stay on afterward. We know that people may have a one o'clock meeting, got to have time to go to the bathroom, grab a snack or whatever. So we're going to try to wrap up the main part of the program here at about five minutes too, but we'll stick around to answer a few questions. And I see a few questions are already appearing in the chat. And so if panelists want to just keep an eye on that and be ready to answer, that would be great. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, so Katie, I have questions for you. Thank you so much for joining us, Katie. So if a farmer in Iowa County is interested in performing a soil health test, um, what type of resources could Iowa County provide to farmers? And do you see farms in Iowa County that could benefit from a greater focus on soil health? And what could be a good suggestion as a first step? Yeah, we definitely um, have resources to help farmers with this issue. Um, we do have a soil health test kit here in our office and Landon's been trained on that. So he can go out and visit a farm and do some of the tests that you saw in the video. Um, I believe Gene Kriefer has one as well in, in the extension. And of course, taking the classes from Kevin and getting your own soil health test kit is, is another option. Um, yeah, there's, there's definitely still a need for these types of practices and, and improved soil health in this county and statewide, nationwide. Um, you know, we're definitely still seeing erosion issues, um, flooding issues, we're getting these heavier rains, so soil health is more important than ever. Um, so what I would recommend is, um, if someone's kind of new to this idea, um, is just to start learning. There's so many resources online and really good videos. Kevin shared some of those resources. Um, once we start doing field days again, keep your eye out. There's always a lot of field days going on where you can hear from farmers who are doing these practices. Um, join a farm lead group or start one if there isn't one in your area and then you really get that peer learning that's really valuable. Um, and then after that, you know, do some basic soil testing, create that, that nutrient management plan, do some of the soil health tests that Landon talked about um, to see where you're at right now with the practices that you're doing. And then I would recommend talking to land conservation staff. In other states, they might call that the Soil and Water Conservation District. Um, talk to university extension staff, talk to your agronomist, talk to your fellow farmers and your neighbors and see what's going on. Um, the Natural Resources Conservation Service is also another good resource to contact um, to learn about what options you might have and the changes that you wanna try to implement on your farm. Um, and then after that, um, maybe think about some cost sharing. So the counties and the NRCS have money for cover crops, for no-till, for things like that to help you get over that first hurdle of just getting started and um, you know, helping get over some of those initial costs. Um, so those are you know, what I would recommend for some first steps. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, and next we'll be hearing from Sherry. We have a couple questions that were submitted during registration. So Sherry, some of the questions that we got are, can you hurt dung beetles when you're receding pasture? What is the impact of chemical dewormers on dung beetle populations? And what are techniques for attracting dung beetles? Yeah, so um, reseeding pastures, if there are active um, or recent dung piles in that area that you're interseeding, um, you can disturb the dweller species that are in there, but within three to four days of, of a manure pad dropping, the uh, majority of the adult beetles will have flown off to the next fresh manure that's out there. So they're not going to be highly disturbed by that. The dweller species that are in the manure pats, if you um, drag those manure pats out, um, they, will, they will not be able to complete their life cycle. And a lot of them, their larvae is predatory on the face fly and horn fly larvae. So keeping those um, those dweller species, especially the hydrophilids, um, which have been very active at our farm, uh, there to eat those uh, larval species, larval forms is really beneficial. If you're reseeding a pasture from, say, a crop field or something, there's not going to be dung beetles there anyway because they're they're attracted to fresh manure. They're not attracted to anything that's old or um, even spread manure from a barn. They're they're really not going to be likely. Um, going for that, certainly not for compost. So minimal there. Um, dewormers, I can share my screen here. Um, there's uh, certain types of dewormers um, are detrimental for dung beetles. 
uh, the ivermectin, the, the macrocyclic lactones are the, the types that tend to be the most problematic, where ivermectin is the worst one, but dormectin and acrinomectin are also bad. Within the lac macrocyclic lactones, the moxidectin class is not um, so much of a problem with and for the dung beetles. Um, the impacts of these of ivermectin, especially on the dung beetles, is it's a larva slide. So it will kill the larvae that consume it. And it ex it's excreted through um, the GI tract intact as an intact chemical. So um, when it hits the ground, the beetles will lay their eggs in um, the manure or um, carry that manure down for tunneling species and lay their eggs in the manure ball. But uh, when the larvae hatch and they start eating the, the protein and other things that are within that manure, they eat the um, ivermectin and that kills them. So it, it halts their life cycle at that stage. Um, to avoid the impacts on dung beetles from um, dewormers, you would use ivermectin in the fall if you have a, a cold period of the year like we have here and the dung beetles go dormant over winter any manure that's dropped after um, the weather's gotten too cold for them to uh, be active isn't going to affect the dung beetles. Using um, some of the other chemical dewormers during the summer, if that's uh, desirable in your system, is a way to approach that also um, to keep those dung beetles alive um, and providing all of the um, the opportunities for those dung beetles to be active at the farm um, by not spreading the manure, like leaving the piles of manure, especially for the um, species that are uh, dwelling species that need that between two and six weeks, depending on the species, uh, for that manure pile to sit in place to complete the, the full life cycle um, is beneficial for keeping those ones there even without um, ivermectin in the system. And then um, you had asked about uh, technical um, ways of keeping dung beetles in the system. Yes, and attracting. No, I will stop sharing since this is not moving forward. Um, try just doing it this way. So um, um, the problem with the, the ivermectin then too is that we don't get the manure piles breaking down as fast as um, they would if we had the uh, dung beetles in the system. And also um, all of these, these predatory dung beetles that eat their larvae, eat the larvae of face flies and horn flies won't be in those piles then to reduce those pest species. So then more chemicals need to be applied. I've read that um, the pyrethrins, um, which is a fly repellent chemical typically used in ear tags or other um, fly applications are also detrimental to dung beetles. So if we can use the dung beetles to provide that face fly and horn fly benefit, that's a better way to go about it. If they'll work sufficiently for that, then um, using these chemicals. And I say that if because um, some of the challenges with dung beetles is um, attracting a diversity of them, but then here in uh, Wisconsin we don't have quite as numerous or as big a dung beetles as they have in more southern areas. Um, getting those populations up high enough when we have a restricted season, so with our, our um, uh, winters um, being half of our year here and low activity, very low activity during that frozen part of the year, uh, it's quite a challenge. Um, we don't, we really don't have rollers here that focus on livestock. They, they focus on native species or other um, food sources like mushrooms and things like that in forest systems instead of pastures. Um, most of our species are dwellers. Um, we have a diversity of dwellers, there's quite a few of those, but um, those, their larvae eat manure, they don't eat predator um, or pest species like the, the flies. 
uh, our hydrophilids and um, the false clown beetles, which we found in manure at our farm, do eat those pest species. Plus we have rove beetles and golden dung flies, which also use the manure that isn't treated with chemicals to um, to breed on and find a, um, they eat flies that are attracted to the manure. So they help reduce fly um, issues on the livestock. Uh, and then also the challenges um, besides just providing the ideal source, which is manure untreated from a chemical perspective, manure that um, has low disturbance in that first um, few weeks that it's out there. Uh, we have so many different life history strategies um, that if you focus on just one species of beetle and managing for that, it's not necessarily going to support all the others. So thinking about the different life history strategies of the ones that are in the manure at your own farm um, is probably the best way to go about managing for those. And um, like Jean said, if you if you build it, they will come. If you provide the manure, they're, they're out there. Um, people ask questions about, well, where can I buy these? How do I import them? If you, if you don't um, have chemically treated manure out there, they'll find it and they'll reproduce in it and the population will grow over time. Some of these species have like two week, three week cycle turnaround, complete life cycle turnaround, and some of them only have two generations within one summer growing season. So the ones that only have two generations aren't necessarily going to re rebuild their population or build a new population as fast as those that have the faster generation turnaround time. Um, and so we have to think about those different strategies um, when managing and, and um, trying to, to keep those species around. All right. Thank you so much, Sherry. And, and just a reminder, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We're so happy that everyone's interested in this topic. You are all welcome to stay on for a little bit more so that we can continue this discussion. And if you want, you can um, unmute yourself and directly ask um, one of the panelists a question that you have. And we'll, be tr we'll try to monitor the chat box, too, to ask those questions. If you have some that are directed to a specific person, please make sure to indicate that. So one of the questions we have is from Sharon. Uh, Sharon says, we have a major dand dandelion overgrowth in our horse pasture, and we're going to treat it chemically this spring. Will dung beetles be able to thrive after that treatment? Um, Sherry and Dean, anyone wants to answer this one? Uh, major dandelion overgrowth, they're going to treat it chemically in the spring. Will dung beetles be able to thrive after that treatment? I've not seen any, any publications of herbicides affecting dung beetles. Um, Nadine, do you know of any particular ones that may? Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. I think because if you're using an herbicide that you spray like directly on them or that, like the dung beetles aren't going to be in that soil directly where the dandelions are. I mean, they'll be in the dung. So I don't, I wouldn't expect to see a like major negative impact on them. The other, not from the dung beetle perspective, but why would you want to kill dandelions? Um, they're a really high quality feed source for a lot of livestock. Now, if what you've got grazing isn't eating them, uh, then it's probably legitimately a weed. But when we think about you know, diversity of insect life, we want diversity of, of, of uh, plant species life. Uh, and we think about uh, that whole idea of gas and water exchange. Dandelion has a really robust taproot that's going fairly deep in the soil. Uh, so having dandelions when that dandelion does die uh, is actually really good. And uh, I, I don't know, I don't try to actively kill dandelions, um, but if, if whatever you're grazing isn't consuming them, then, then maybe I'd reconsider that. But just think of it as an alternative feed. Thank you. Does anyone uh, want to unmute themselves and ask a question to the panelists right now? You are welcome to do so. Um, okay. A another question that came in through the chat box is what impact does diatomaceous earth have on dung beetles? Diatomaceous. Yes, diatomaceous. Thank Everybody you. knows that Alejandra. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
diatomaceous earth uh, would not have any, should not have any impact on dung beetles. All right. And does urea application negatively impact dung beetles? Does anyone on the, on the panel know? Urea application, does it negatively impact dung beetles? If the urea is applied while plants are growing and not over applied, that's so soluble and readily absorbed by the plants that, again, that's something that would end up in the soil and not necessarily within the brood ball or within the dung, wouldn't necessarily get incorporated into the dung where the beetles are living. And the plants would be taking that up so quickly if you have an active growing forage stand out there. So I don't think that would be all that big a deal. If it, perhaps if it was terribly over applied and um, too much salts into the system, that might be an issue. But, yeah, yeah I, I, I haven't seen any data of that, but I would agree with Sherry. Um, unlikely, and if it did, it might be on the, bio the, the microbiology more so than uh, a dung beetle. All right, and so Melita says, so advice is not to pick manure piles and pasture. I don't, but a friend just bought a farm and they do. Should I pass this on to them? Um, so for, from my perspective, um, it depends on what level of dung beetle activity you can attract to your farm. Um, I, in looking at the videos and things from Australia and other places, um, even in southern United States, the um, these larger beetles and the huge populations that they get in those areas um, are different than what we have up here. And so our dung manure, our manure pats don't disappear as fast as what they do in more southern areas. And I haven't seen any studies from uh, in in areas like where I live where the, the dung beetles reduce, they dry out the manure pat. Um, the dwellers and the, the tunnelers will remove manure and dry out that pat a little bit, but not nearly as much as what they've, I've seen in other places. Um, it's really, there, there haven't been studies that say what percent reduction in pest species, pest fly species and other um, undesirable species that are attracted to the manure. Um, how much they're reduced up here with the level of activity of dung beetles that we have up here compared to um, the charts and graphs that I've found in publications from other places around the world. Um, there's there's the that aspect of spreading manure is is disturbing the habitat for the dung beetles, but then also spreading manure is for um, distributing uh, manure and nutrients across your pasture and through livestock management by um, rotationally grazing, inten more intensively managing the livestock with smaller areas and a larger number of areas um, that you're rotating through, those animals will distribute their manure more evenly across the land and those dung beetles uh, will help integrate that manure um, into the uh, soil system. All right, thank you. An another question that we received is, what is the relationship between chickens and dung beetles? So chickens and dung beetles. They'll definitely eat them. We, we uh, raise chickens, we rotate the chickens with the horses and uh, goats and sheep and cattle pigs. Uh, where they have access to the manure, they eat the, the dung beetles just like they would eat any other insect out there. But the wild birds do the same thing, as do bats and small rodents. Um, in the areas that our chickens don't get to. So our paddocks are long, fairly long in shape and the chickens don't wander out that far. Um, the, the dung beetles do well out there. Um, the wild bird, uh, we have bobolinks and meadowlarks and all kinds of native species plus uh, brown-headed cowbirds and things that aren't so great, but they, they're out there. Um, they eat the dung beetles. So um, there's wildlife and um, your chickens will eat will eat the dung beetles, scratch the manure piles apart. If you hold the chickens back for three to five days after the manure is dropped before you let them have access to it, the majority of the adult dung beetles will have come in, laid their eggs, dug their tunnels, and left and gone to new manure. So then 
then those chickens can scratch it apart and eat the larvae of the face flies and various other things that the the um, predatory species would of dung beetle that would be eating so they'd be competing with those predatory dung beetles for the fly larvae but um, they're also your chickens then are also spreading that manure pile out and, and being another biological form of integration of the nutrients back into the soil system. All right, we got another question in the chat box from Dale. Dale says, I'm on my second year of perennial grass and legumes after the land was row cropped for over 20 years. I haven't noticed any dung beetles yet. Anything other advice that was not mentioned yet to attract them? I mean, I, I would say that if there is dung present, the beetles will definitely find it. Um, so that's kind of the main thing is just, you know, the dung being out there. Um, again, it, depending on like if you have cow patties, one of the easiest ways to determine if you have the dung beetles is to look for little holes that look like they're kind of drilled in through the top of like a crusted over a cow patty that would indicate that you have um, dwellers and even um, possibly tunnelers that are present. Um, it may be a matter of, um, you know, if you're out during the day, like physically looking for them, there are certainly several species that are only active at night and you just wouldn't encounter them, um, you know, depending on when you're out um, actively looking for them. So it's likely that, you know, things are present. Um, it may be that uh, you might see a kind of gradual um, shift in species based on, you know, how long the area had been row cropped and now it's been converted. Um, that might take a little bit more time, um, but I would expect that eventually you could see a bit of turnover and, you know, eventually even um, more numbers coming in. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay, we'll take one more question. So if someone has a question, please uh, type it into the chat box or if we missed it because the chat box was moving around, you can retype it again. So now's your chance. Did any of the panelists see any questions at the chat box that we I might have missed? There was there was one on um, why don't we introduce species um, like they've done in Australia, imported um, species from uh, Africa. A lot of the really active um, dung beetles in Australia are from Africa. They have similar climates and and uh, seasonality, so those dung beetles work well there. The challenge we have here is finding sources or um, identifying beetles that can survive over a frozen winter when it, um, the soil does freeze deeper than most of the beetles we have here did. Um, so trying to find species, I would love to have more species here in a, and larger populations, but I haven't found anything out there. Um, there's a group called Dung Beetle Exchange on Facebook that's very active in this uh, area, plus um, they have a propagation group, so you can join that and, and learn how to um, propagate and collect and um, find people who are also as passionate about dung beetles as the rest of us are. Um, and hopefully find some species that are adapted to your area. And the ones we have here are adapted here. Finding more that are adapted has been challenged for us, which is why we haven't uh, imported any. I mean, in the southern U.S. there is the imported um, Digidonthophagus gazellus, so it's kind of related to our dwellers, the Anthophagus group, and that one, um, you know, it's adapted to a warm kind of year-round climate, and it does a really good job, especially on the large like CAFO types of places and just in dealing with the cattle dung and turning it over pretty quickly. Um, unfortunately, with our winters up here in the seasonality, um, it just wouldn't be a practical species to maintain up here. Like it would likely not be able to survive our winters. 
All right, thank you. So we're just gonna wrap up our questions. Um, thank you so much to our panelists and thank you so much to everyone who attended. If you have any more questions, I can help facilitate contact with our panelists. So I did type in my contact information in the chat box. It's a Hernandez at michaelfields.org and I'll try to compile more questions and, and um, get it to the appropriate uh, panelist. Um, but thank you everyone for sticking on and this is, has been such a fun topic. It's been so much fun to learn about dung beetles and I was so surprised to see them in Wisconsin and, 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 and it's great. It's so great to see them and how they are an indicator for a really cool and healthy farm ecosystems. So thank you so much for, for for your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you.